Uh, hello, I'm Tom Harris. I'm the director of the University Center for Economic Development, at UNR, and also a state extension specialist. Uh, today we have Mike Helmer and Malika Borgiglione, who run the Nevada part of uh, Ag and Food Policy Institute. They do a lot of forecasts of ag prices. And a lot of us, if you go to the grocery store, you've been reading, you can't find turkeys, the price of a lot of agricultural products have moved up and there's a, a lot of uh, supply chain problems. Well, how does this impact the Nevada producer? And this, what we're gonna do with this podcast, we usually do them quarterly, but just give an update what's going on. We're gonna look at the cow, calf, dairy, sheep and alfalfa markets. And I believe Mike Helmer is gonna start this off or maybe Malika, but go right ahead. And I would say folks, if you could, please uh, put your uh, speakers on mute. And at the end of the presentation, we'll ask some questions. So go ahead. Do you, you want me to start with Malika? Sure. Okay, well, Malika is the one that runs the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute. Now, I, I, I basically do what she tells me to do. So uh, <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the commodities that Tom just listed there, cow, calf, dairy, sheep and alfalfa, hay, just kind of a snapshot of what's going on uh, in the state of Nevada. And we have a little five-year set of projections that we go out there. The reason why we usually don't share all five years on these things, but the reason, one of the reasons why I want to do it now is just because there's kind of a theme here and the theme is uncertainty. Uh, we have a lot of uncertainty around the whole economy uh, dealing with, 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 with COVID and, 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 and other things um, that, are, that are still still going on here and some of the fallout from that. And if we go to our first slide, we can explain that a little, a little bit better. Uh, that is, this one shows GDP growth. Uh, and it goes out through, actually through calendar 2026. And this is a percent change from year over year. And if you can see down here, this is last year. This is our, our big COVID year. And the blue is the world total. Uh, the red is developed countries, of which the U.S. is a major part of. The green is emerging economies like China, uh, former Soviet Union, uh, you know, Russia, and those are emerging economies. And then the purple ones are developing countries. And what we can see is that last year, global GDP growth just tanked. And none of us are surprised by that. We, we've seen the numbers. We, we know that, that, that it tanked. But it shows it coming back this year in 2021. Now, keep in mind that these are still some projections here. Uh, so it's not there, but it shows that uh, the world as a whole, or rather the developed, the world as a whole declined by nearly 4% last year. And it's expected to come back by 5.5% this year. The developed countries, of which the US is one, declined by about 4.5% last year. And it's coming back about a little under 5% this year, four and a half to 5% this year. There's a lot of uncertainty. If we were to take, look at these projections from just a month earlier, the decline estimated for last year was larger and the recovery was bigger this year. So there's just a whole lot of uncertainty out there. We really don't have a good grasp of what's going on uh, in terms of the, the global economy right here. But then the anticipation is that we will eventually, over the next couple of years, get back to about a long-term growth pattern, 3% for the world, 2% for the developing econ developed economies, um, developing, developing near 4%. So, but it's going to take us a while to get back to that. I would be a not too surprised if the 2022 numbers that are, that are right here, the next year over from the black vertical line, are worse than what they show here. Uh, there's still a lot going on in terms of, uh, of the global economy. Um, and, and it's not just it's not just COVID, but it's things like uh, a, a debt, things about getting people back to work, uh, the supply chain, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the economy is very, very precarious right now, and it's uncertain. Mike, can I just jump in real quick and make a couple comments? Yeah. Um, first, I uh, want to mention these first two slides we're looking at are from uh, projections from IH macroeconomic projections from IHX 
market that we received in October. Um, the slides in the later part of this, and we received those projections a couple times a year around um, January, July, October. Um, and uh, the rest of the slides you'll see in here was based on data from July. So keep that in mind as we get more into the state specific uh, data and information and projections. Um, these first two slides, I just want to mention that, as Mike's saying, you know, we kind of expect that these, um, that the macro won't come in as optimistic, I guess, as, as, as it looks right now. It might be a little more um, downtrending. And we did see that in our October data as compared to our July data. So the July um, GDP growth and um, so forth showed a much more optimistic picture than we saw later in the year. And I guess that a lot of that had to do with the Delta surge and how that um, further entrenched these um, existing supply chain problems that were already there. With that. Okay. Oh, and one other comment that I would like to make is if we look at that growth in 2021, it looks like, okay, even at, at four or four and a half percent, we're doing pretty well. I mean, if you have to remember that these are growth rates and these are not level of GDP. If we were to go back to the level of GDP in 2019, let's, let's say the third quarter of 2019, to give us two years ago, we dropped a lot in 2020. Now with, with our growth of four and a half percent this year, we are just now barely back to the levels that we were in, in two years ago, in the third quarter of 2019, looking at the Bureau of Economic Analysis data uh, that, that they just put out in October, we are just now gotten back to where we were. So it's not like, even though we've got growth, it's not like our level of economic activity has, 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 um, has increased. It, it compared to 2019, it's about where we were. So that's, we think about that in terms of, of consumption impacts. Uh, we're, we're not going to get a, a big, a big increase over two years ago. We're probably going to be about the same level. This one, this is exchange rates. And we just want to talk about this briefly is, is that uh, if we look at exchange rates for various groups of countries around the world, again, we're looking at the world, advanced, emerging and developing economies. The takeaway I want to give you about this is the purple line that you can see it, that, that uh, developing countries were weakening against the US dollar. It's been a long-term decline. That depreciation accelerated drastically uh, this year, after 2020 into, into this year. And then it's expected to kind of go back to the long-term depreciation rates. Even if we adjust for the relative levels, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the relative inflation levels between those countries and the US to adjust that in terms of purchasing power, we still see a big depreciation in the developing countries. And why this is important is if we look at our set of developing countries, they are viewed and have been viewed for a long time as major markets, major expanding markets for agricultural exports. So that, 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 that tells us that for those kinds of commodities that we export to developing countries, and by and large, those are grains and oil seeds, not always so much things like meats and dairy, but by and large, it's grains and oil seeds, um, that uh, that trade is going to be constrained because those countries are not able to purchase what they used to be able to purchase. <clears throat> and now let's go into some state Level level things. These are our, our hay and forage prices. For I want to get this thing out of the way. Uh, for for Nevada, right now this year in 2020 or in 2021 and 2022, hay prices have been relatively robust in Nevada, particularly alfalfa. And as I looked at the state uh, state average hay prices a couple of days ago, and they only have them through September, uh, the, the data that's, that's out there, but those hay prices have maintained uh, uh, relatively high levels uh, throughout this year and even since last year. Uh, state average prices, now in your area, those prices can vary uh, from, from the state average prices, but state average prices show 
in 2020 and thus far in 2021 for alfalfa hay anywhere from $180 to over $190. Right now they're at about $185 a ton. Other hay, grass hays, uh, on average are about $180 a ton. So they've maintained those price levels and, uh, and that's been, been good for, for uh, those who sell hay, not so good for those who buy hay. It hits, hits like our dairy industry. It hits our, our winter feeding for, for cattle a little bit. We expect those prices to moderate over the next few years that they'll, that they'll come back down as, as uh, you know, feed prices generally moderate. Uh, prices are high right now. If we start looking at, at the feed complex in general, we see very high corn prices, very high soybean and therefore soybean meal prices, uh, not all of which are fed in, in Nevada, but they, they do influence Nevada prices. Uh, so hay also follows that in the short term uh, across the country. So right now we've got high prices that are dictated by the other high feed prices around the country. Uh, and, and other, other feed types. And it's gonna take us a few years till we can uh, kind of uh, moderate those prices a little bit. But even at that, we expect to see hay prices to be relatively decent for, for producers. One of the reasons why the hay prices, particularly in Nevada have remained high is certainly hay is, is, is moved across state line. But sometimes locally, there's, there's, you, get a, you get a little bump for supplies. And if we looked at what's going on here, that particularly with the drought, that our hay acreage in Nevada, that is the, the hay acreage um, harvested, there are a number, of, a number of cuttings, and to a certain extent, the yield, but not so much the yield because it's mostly ir irrigated when we have the water. But our hay acreage is down over the years. <clears throat> the green bar, over on the right for 2021, that was the intentions that, that uh, uh, Nevada hay growers reported at the beginning of the year, at the end of, at the end of March. That that's what their intentions were to grow. Looking at <coughs> the preliminary data for, for cuttings through June and, and, and all, doesn't seem that they've gotten too far off of that. And again, we haven't had a lot of water so even though there's irrigation there, there is, there is water. There's been some, uh, particularly for the, for the surface water, there's been some restrictions on water allotments this year, and they haven't been putting as much water on it, and a lot of places have reduced a, a cutting. So that hay acreage harvested is down this year, and that will kind of support on a very localized level some, some of the hay prices. <clears throat> this is kind of takes a look at, at the drought situation that we've been talking about here. The one on the right is from two weeks ago. And you can see the severe amount of drought across Nevada. The one on the left at that time, or the one on the left is, is just from a couple of days ago. This is after the rains that we got in the western part of the state a couple of weeks ago. And so some drought, there has been some relief, a little bit of relief, but it's still, if you look at the, the legend, that color there, that's still severe drought. So we're still very short of water and will continue to be unless we get a well above average year for the rest of the year in terms of, of both localized precipitation and snowpack in those places that depend on that. That would be like in Western Nevada and going over into, into parts of Eastern Nevada where the snowpack and the rubies and those places have an impact on, on the water supplies. So we're not out of the woods yet. We're still very tight on water. Malika, did you want to say anything more about the drought? No. I think, I think you pretty much covered it. One of the, um, like you said, it, it, it had little impact. You can see mostly in the Northern Sierra. And <clears throat> when I, Looked at this this morning. Um, the drought monitor reports percentages within each drought class. So um, the only drought class that decreased was the uh, D4, which is the next to highest drought class, and it only decreased by about 11%. So it is it helped, but it is really um, in in the large scheme of things, really pretty minimal. 
One other comment I'd like to make about this has got me scratching my head a little bit. <clears throat> other than for that area in the extreme western part of the state, the rest of the state looks identical to October 19th. So I've got to kind of wonder if, if everything has been updated. I think so. I looked at the um, national map quickly. And um, even with those storms moving across, there still is persistent drought. Um, in fact, it's impacting a lot of the winter wheat planting um, in areas. So it's not just us. It's just the drought is so severe. Um, and that is, I'm not an expert in that area, but that's my interpretation. Yeah, but the shapes are identical. If, if you're looking at it, they're absolutely identical other than, than in the western part of the state. And I said about that, that's just speculation on my part. <laughs> okay, so what we have here is um, uh, the, the operating, co the costs and the gross revenues per harvested acre for alfalfa. And as you can see that uh, here's 2020, um, that uh, we, we did have some reductions in, uh, in gross revenues because there was a little bit of a yield impact. Uh, in 2021, 2021 here, our costs have gone up somewhat, but our prices are, are pretty good and it's showing some profitability in, in the hay sector. Now, the prices that have gone up, uh, as you might expect, and that really impacts hay, are fuel costs. I mean, there have been other costs. Labor costs have gone up as well, but the fuel costs are, are costs that have really gone up quite a bit uh, since the beginning of this year. Uh, I mean, everybody knows you go you go to the to the pump, uh, you, the money you're paying for your gas, the money I'm paying for diesel out here for, for my equipment uh, is a lot more expensive than it used to be. And, and those of you that, that are out there watching this stuff, you realize that. So costs Costs are up this year, but because the prices are up for Nevada hay producers, uh, they're still making money on a, on, a, on a dollar per harvested acre. Now, now we go back to looking at the reduction in, in our, our acres harvested, and that's where, that's where hay producers are getting hit. They're being able, even though per acre it's, it's profitable, they're harvesting fewer acres. So their total revenues will be suffering this year. <clears throat> Let's turn over to, to feeder cattle. This is two years of, uh, I think it's weekly feeder cattle prices. Uh, and this is from NASDAQ. Um, you can, can see that, you, well, first of all, let's go, go back to the beginning. That's January of 2000. And the next January is January of 2020. I mean, uh, January of 2020. Uh, and this next one's January of 2021. You see these troughs down here in the bottom. And we all know about that. That's, that's when COVID first hit. We saw a lot of, ah, excuse me. That's when COVID first hit. We saw reductions in slaughter, big reductions in slaughter. We saw the supply chain issues and we weren't able to move cattle through the system and ranchers suffered. They, they saw a lot lower prices in that period of time. And then that came back up. Uh, towards the end of the year, and it's been up and down, and it and, and it was rising. It was looking pretty good through about the middle to the end of September. And now we've had the big surge in COVID again, and there's a couple of things going on here. One is that um, the number of cattle being slaughtered dipped a little bit going into September. And, and, and October, it's still pretty decent. And we'll look at that again in, 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 in a minute. We've got a chart, a chart for that. Uh, but we still have uh, supply chain issues going out. They're getting things into markets. And as markets, as retail markets back up, then the demand for cattle and slaughterhouses goes down, which gives us our little dip that we've seen this year. And that just backs things right up through, through, uh, uh, feedlots and into, into, into pastures and, and BLM land that our local ranchers utilize. And those prices have dipped again in the last, uh, in the last month and a half. And again, in the last week, they've, they've, they've come off a little bit as, as well. So it's still kind of a tenuous situation. And also this is a time of year when 
when many cattle are marketed. So we sometimes get a cyclical decline in those prices. But right now, cattle prices are a bit on, on the weak side. Uh, and as we look at the, as I looked at the state, some state level feeder cattle prices, uh, for the national average, they're a little over $150 uh, per hundred weight. For Nevada, they're down to about 145 right now. So because of, of where we exist and the fact that we have to ship our cattle out, we have a little bit lower prices than the, than the national average normally. That's, that's a normal thing. But we have seen a decline in the last week or two in our cattle prices by about a buck or two uh, per hundred weight. So right now there's weakness in our local markets. Oh, here, here are the, the, the cattle we talked about. I don't know if you can see this very well. I hope you can. Uh, the overall average for the nation is about 152 bucks this week. And that's actually up from a week ago and up from a month ago. For Nevada, we're 145. We're down from both a week and a month ago. So our cattle are not moving off the range uh, as quickly as possible, which tells me that that uh, feed lots for, for stocker operations and in feed lots, they don't want to take as many cattle right now because they're having starting to have a little bit of a difficult time moving things through. Not like they had a year and a half ago, but it's starting to become just a little more difficult now. And that's giving weakness to places like Nevada, uh, which are very dependent on markets elsewhere. But the supply chain bottleneck has opened to a large extent. If we look back here at the red line, that was last year, and that's that's our cattle slaughter, and this is on a monthly basis. You can see that that it, that it tanked. We all know that, and that it came back up some. And in twenty, uh, in, in, but in in twenty twenty one, we're kind of moving along that same line that we did in twenty twenty, but we're still below what happened in twenty nineteen. <laughs> now, if we look at you know, we've talked about cattle on feed, trying to move them through the feedlot. The cattle on feed right now are actually lower than they were a year ago by a little bit, which would imply that we're moving them into, uh, in, into slaughter positions, but that's not necessarily so. They're just taking fewer cattle. But the cattle on feed, even though they're lower than they were a year ago, the October 1 number was still the second highest on record second only to last year. So we're still got a kind of a, a, a glut of cattle that we're trying to move through. It's not a severe glut anymore, but there's a glut of cattle that's trying to be moved through the, the supply chain, through the system to be slaughtered. Uh, so it's, it's, it's getting a little, a little difficult again to move those, those cattle through the system. Don't expect to see what happened a year and a half ago, but there are some headwinds to uh, the, the cattle uh, supply chain. So that's still, that's still going on this year a little bit. But for the most part, the bottleneck has opened quite a bit. And here's our, our, uh, our cow-calf operators. And this is, this is in terms of these are the cost and the value of production. <laughs> and this is uh, in terms of dollars per bred cow. So this is very, very specific to a Nevada or a Western cattle operation, cow-calf uh, operation. And we can see that in, in, in 2020, that, that's a result of our cattle prices dropping. That's our gross value of production. Now, this is not just selling those cattle, but it also includes where, where that it was boosted is liquidating part of the herd, part of the breeding herd. And that happened, that helped boost some, some of, of, of the profits a little bit last year, but it's still, still nothing like what it has been in the past. We're looking for things to be a little bit better this year, but here's the but. Again, this is go back, goes back to our uncertainty of things that we looked at. Is if we look at the, the cattle prices now, they're lower than what we expected coming out of July and August when we did these numbers. So um, we're maybe a little optimistic for 2021 here. Uh, and and the, the, uh, the profitability for Nevada ranchers may not be quite as robust as we're looking at here. But as we move into the future, those prices will come back as costs stay, um, stay 
moderate or moderate somewhat, uh, we do expect to see profitability re return to the to the cow calf industry, especially since the part that we're at in the cattle cycle, we're at a part where we're coming off lower prices. And we expect to see prices strengthen uh, in the next few years, particularly as, as cattle inventories uh, begin to de begin to decline a little a little bit cyclically. Uh, so we do expect profitability to return in the next few years. This year is still a bit of a challenge. Can I, sorry, Mike, I just wanted to jump in really quick. Yeah. And I do think, as I mentioned um, earlier, that uh, the data that we're using in these current projections were based on July numbers. And so these cost levels for the operating costs um, and likely the other fee costs as well may be flatter here than what they actually will be upcoming. I suspect if we updated this with more, um, if we had more current data to update this now, that we might see these costs increasing at a, at a steeper level than is reflected here, which of course will narrow the margin as well. Yeah, now the macro data was from July. The price data here is from August. Right, but it's driven by the same yeah, underlying yeah, thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, as we redo the baseline this, later this month and compare it to August, I think the things that Malika just talked about are going to become evident, which is why I'm, I'm telling you to take this with a grain of salt, that there is uncertainty surrounding these, these projections, probably more so than any time that I've ever dealt with. Uh, the amount of uncertainty that, that that's that's here right now. So, um, you know, if, if you see numbers that, that that look optimistic to you, don't go to the bank with them. Uh, they're they're it, it's very likely that uh, there, there's just a big range of uncertainty around them. Okay, let's talk about dairy a little bit. We all, we all heard about what happened in, in a lot of the dairy markets across the country when COVID hit. We had um, dairy product demand and even fluid milk demand crash. I mean, we, we took, uh, took people out of restaurants, we took kids out of schools, uh, and those were big parts of demand for dairy uh, and dairy products. And as you can see that if we look at, I can never find my cursor, there we go, that if we look at this last year that uh, our, our our prices came 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 off of where they were a year before and that that's even with some strength at the end of the year but we did see a huge reduction in milk demand and one of the ways that those that those prices were held up you know you read the stories you saw the anecdotal evidence that says <clears throat> dairy producers were dumping milk and we saw on the news showing dairy farmers pouring it down the drain. That happened as, as well, and they were moving it off in, 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 into other areas, uh, but they were dumping the milk and it just wasn't hitting the market. And that's one of the ways that helped maintain some prices uh, toward, particularly towards the end of the year. But the manufacturing level prices, and, and for example, this, is, this, is, this class one milk is fluid milk, milk that we drink. This class three is manufacturing milk. And what that is, is that's things that we make, butter, cheese, non-fat dry milk, whole milk powder, which we do in Nevada, both, both non-fat dry and whole milk powder. Those are the prices that the, <clears throat> that the dairy farmers were receiving when they sold into those processing, processing places. And you can see that last year, the the, the, the milk price dropped significantly for those folks. Now they did have some, some policy, uh, uh, the, the dairy market program uh, that helped support them. They did have some of that, but that was used less in Nevada than a lot of other places. That, that has mostly been geared towards smaller producers in other states. We have large dairies here. But with the milk prices coming up or with the, the demand returning, the institutional demand returning, uh, holiday demand is coming up for milk products. Uh, and maybe a little bit in some places on the international market, that coming back a little bit 
that we are seeing some higher uh, manufacturing milk prices uh, in the U.S. and uh, and even though that, that the that the fluid milk prices are remaining about about constant elsewhere, but we're starting to be able to get more milk moving through the the, the processed product supply chain. Still not real robust. Uh, certainly nothing like we saw in in in, in past years, uh, and it's still not still not real robust. The other thing that's that's hitting these guys is particularly in some of the places where we still move milk into California from Nevada, which is much less than it used to be, but where we still do that is the transportation costs are much higher so that back at the Nevada dairy farm, they have to, uh, uh, they have to reduce the milk price that, 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 that they get in order to have it be sellable on the processing end or the bottling end. So it's not a real robust time for dairy either right now. And we're taking take a look here at the milk futures price. And the reason I, I use this is from NASDAQ. And the reason I chose the milk futures price is, is that actually has a pretty good um, correspondence to what the, uh, the, the short term market prices are. Uh, and, and I was able to get a lot of data on this. And as you can see, uh, this is where we were a year ago when those prices tanked, people were dumping milk. And this is, this is all milk. This is not, not class one or class three, it's all milk. And then towards the end of the year, it came back up and it's done some, some kind of goofy things around the holidays last year, but it was pretty low this year. And it came back up, but it's still remaining relatively low. We got some boost here going, going into the, uh, in, in the school year here. Uh, so we started getting some of that and, and where people were getting more confident before this, before the Delta variant became so severe that people started pulling back on things again. Uh, we started getting a little more optimistic, but then as we got into November, those milk prices are coming back off again. Um, we're beginning to lose some of those people wanting to eat out and some of those uh, uh, dairy product production. This this tells us that that the ex, that the expectations are not for real robust demand in the next few weeks and and perhaps moving in into the uh, uh, the the holiday season. So again, there's still a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty surrounding the dairy markets and the futures markets are indicating that as well as local, uh, as, as current market prices. And this is what happened in Nevada last year. As we started, as we started the started in, into 2020, uh, we started we started liquidating the number of, of dairy cows that we had going in last year. A lot of places did that. Uh, our milk production still remained relatively high. We had feed, we fed them. Um, and this number, I, I, I kind of am expecting, expecting to see a, a revision on. Uh, I don't know that we would have been feeding that much more uh, to do that to maintain our milk production. But as we go, in, go into 2021 here, our dairy cows have slid further. We're down to uh, the lowest level since about 2015, 2016. In other words, what we did is the it is the, the increase in, in dairy cow inventories that we saw surrounding the whole milk powder plant in Fallon. There was a response to that. And, and we actually built probably uh, our herds by about 4,000 4, head. We've lost that in the last two years. Uh, most of that, we've lost about 3,000 head in the last two years and our milk production has, has declined. Uh, and so it's a matter of building herds back. Now, there's a couple of ways that that happens in, in, in Nevada and a lot of, because we have a relatively small dairy industry, even though the individual farms are relatively good size. One is to buy, buy dairy cows from other places, a lot of times, particularly um, uh, California and, and Arizona. Uh, but the other one is to just increase through breeding and that, that just takes a while uh, to do. So it's gonna be a while before we return our, our dairy cow inventories up to where they were and get our milk production really back on track 
uh, and to be able to fully supply the whole milk powder plant. We're still short of being able to fully supply. We're still bringing uh, milk in, in to supply that, that plant right now. But it's just gonna take a while before we can build back our dairy herds. Uh, and the, the price, the next, I think it's the next slide I'm gonna show you, will we'll kind of tell you why a little bit. This one right here, this is the profitability for for Nevada dairy cows, this, uh, for, for Nevada dairy, actually this is based in a range dairy. I've labeled it Nevada. Uh, and as you can see that there was some profitability last year in 2020, but this year, if we look at the blue line here, the blue bar here, what jumps out at us, this is the purchased feed costs. Now, Nevada doesn't have the advantage that, I mean, uh, Dairy doesn't have the advantage that our, our beef cow industry, our cow calf industry has. And they, they, uh, they are the beneficiaries of relatively stable, relatively reasonable um, public grazing fees. Now, there are times when the, the quantity and, and, and of, of the feed and the quality may be lacking a little bit, but that helps hold their, their, their costs down. The purchase feed costs for dairy producers is just that it's purchased from people. We've got higher hay costs in places where they may be feeding, where some of them may be feeding various meals, whether it's soy meal or cottonseed and cottonseed meal. Those prices are up much higher this year. So if they have to purchase feeds, they are coming at a very high premium this year. And what that does is, is it takes this whole cost bar. This is from, this is from other feeds like homegrown feeds. And this is, and the green part of the bar is, I keep losing my cursor, the green part of the bar is business costs, labor costs, things of that nature. Those go up more slowly. Uh, but that whole cost bar is now up very high uh, above what our, the, the vote gross value of production per hundred weight of milk is. So it looks like profits for this year for Nevada dairy producers are going to be very tight, if not, negative in some places. So it's going to be very, very difficult for them. And they are going to have to depend uh, to a certain extent on federal uh, dairy marketing, dairy, uh, trying to think of the name of the program, the DMC. Yeah, the, on those programs to help bolster their revenues. And with can, the, can I do? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to jump in, sorry, really quick about the uh, the feed costs is um, one of the prices we're seeing rising in the US and globally, in fact, is fertilizer costs. So some of these inputs may not be um, as dependent on fertilizer costs as others, but we've seen fertilizer costs double to triple in some cases, and we're seeing shortages of fertilizer um, particularly nitrogen fertilizers in particular, and that's related in part to the rising costs of um, inputs to fertilizer manufacturing, along with the transportation issues and so forth. So this is a really trickle down effect. And I think in terms of Nevada, um, our dairy industry is more likely than our other dominant industries to realize those in, um, the impacts of those rising fertilizer costs sooner. That's true, particularly when you look at some of the feeds that we may buy from out of state. <clears throat> uh, particularly if it's any any grain or grain based feed, uh, those prices are gonna are gonna go up. Uh, if we look at the 2002, you make a very good point there, Malika. If you look at the 2002, we actually have our purchase feed costs higher. Now those are. Much of what was purchased this year in those feed costs had already been produced at before the fertilizer costs in, increased. A lot of those increased with the fuel, particularly if you're talking about nitrogen fertilizer uh, because of natural gas prices, big input into that. Um, our alfalfa hay is not dependent. That's a nitrogen fixing crop. So that's, that's not dependent on nitrogen nitrogen fertilizers to the extent. Some of our other things like our corn silage and all, those are. Those are the things that now that the fertilizer costs are higher for inputs into next spring, those are gonna hit us next year. And you can see that the, the bar for 2022, the cost bar 
is actually expected to be a little bit higher. So part of that goes back to exactly what, what you're talking about, Malika. So anyway, the profitability, given our costs that we're expecting to see, given the milk prices that we're expecting to see out there, uh, the, the revenues for dairy seem to be, uh, the expectations are to be a bit on the paltry side. We hope that something happens that, that changes that. <clears throat> now we wanna talk about, for Nevada, we start looking at the whole milk powder. That's one of the largest exports out of the country for Nevada dairy, not just selling across state lines, but out of, out of the country for, for Nevada dairy. And as you can see that the heyday of, of 2017 and 2018, is gone and we've been low. We came up a little, we came been up and down and came up a little bit in the last couple of quarters. This is the third quarter of 2021. That's the most recent data from, uh, it basically comes from the US Customs Department and it is reported through uh, the USDA, but it's still much lower than it was before. Now, when we built the dairy plant, the milk powder plant in, in Fallon, the expectation was that China was going to be the market for us. Uh, and even though there's a lot of competition from folks in the Pacific uh, Basin, the Australians and the New Zealanders primarily in whole milk powder production, we still expected to be able to compete in that market. Well, China has pulled back purchases of that from, from everybody, uh, but that's not all gloom and doom for us. One is, is our, our dairy plant has the ability to switch from whole milk powder to skim milk powder. Uh, and then, then do something with the butter for that. But skim milk powder, which is a much more broadly purchased thing, even domestically. So we can find markets for that. The other thing is we need to start looking more, and we have been, and, and talking, and, and I, I've talked with a couple of folks from the Fallon plant, and they are looking more globally than just China for, for markets to be able to export into. And as you can see that um, globally, that even though it's down in, in, in the last quarter, but globally, the markets for whole milk powder, uh, and these are imports from the U.S. These are not just imports for the whole market. These are the imports from the U.S. have maintained a lot better than the Chinese markets. So we've done a really good job, not we, the, 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 the folks from uh, the DFA who run that, that milk powder plant, have done a real good job in terms of diversifying to other markets. And that is a real boon for Nevada dairy producers, particularly those uh, in, in, that, uh, in that Fallon area where a lot of that, that milk goes to. So uh, they're, they're doing, they're doing their, their work out there. They're working hard and we're still not out of that game yet. Uh, and so that's, that's a glimmer of, of hope for, for our, our Nevada dairy industry. And now we'll go over and look at, look at, at sheep. Um, I do want to kind of preface this one by saying that uh, the university has recently uh, gotten into a, a sheep station in Eureka County, that er area, for research, for breeding purposes, and things of that nature. Um, to kind of help bolster the sheep industry in, in Nevada, we do have some advantages in the sheep industry in this state and that's not so much the sheep meat and stuff that's that, that that is what it is but it's our wool the wool that comes off of our sheep in nevada and particularly with the merino sheep which are which are what that dairy station is really concentrating on breeding with that and improving those genetics is extremely high quality wool very fine fiber very low small micron wool very fine fine wool and it commands a premium so that's a real boon for for nevada now having said that you can see what has historically happened to the sheep industry in the country. And if we take this back to right after World War II, where we kind of peaked, that would have been off the, way off this chart, the number of, the number of sheep uh, in, in, in the country and in, in Nevada. But we were down to less than 60,000 head, about 52,000 head in Nevada this year. Uh, uh, let me get... Uh, I. I I, I apologize that I don't have the, the right hand 
the, the, the US sheep numbers are on the right hand side. The Nevada sheep numbers are on the left hand side, the left hand scale. I apologize, that's not clear on this. So you can see that we're at about 52,000 in head nationally, we're at about 6 million head. Okay, uh, so our sheep numbers are be declining over time. And that's because demand for, for sheep meat and wool has declined over, over time. We don't eat as much sheep meat in, in, this, in this country as we used to. Uh, we don't wear as much wool as we used to. There are all sorts of synthetic fibers and other fibers that are coming along that have, that have replaced wool. Um, you know, your wool sweaters that were very warm that, that, that uh, we used to wear, like when I was a kid. Don't say anything, Malika. <laughs> uh, and now certainly they still make them, but we have other other warm garments uh, that 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 we now wear um, that have just replaced some wool, uh, and and that has led to the decline in sheep numbers over time. It's just the demand hasn't been there, but that decline for sheep numbers have done a couple of things for us. One of those is that you can see that over time, these are these are average prices for Nevada. The, the blue line is our sheep prices. That's, a, that's an adult sheep. The red line are lamb prices, which oftentimes go to slaughter. And the green line is our, our greasy wool, the wool that we sell on, on the market here. So those prices have, have maintained, have been maintained up there. And the reason is is that the sheep industry has done a very good job of rationalizing its inventories of animals to maintain profitability. They've done a real good job of that. The, the, the total revenues in the sheep industry are much lower than they used to be, but on a dollars per, per hundred way uh, for the, the animals and cents per pound per wool, they maintain those. So if, if a, a, an operation can, can maintain its size or expand in size while other ones shrink and maintain an economy of scale, they can be profitable uh, in, in this. Uh, so, um, you know, we, the, the sheep industry is doing pretty well. One other thing that I want to mention here is you see over time that the, the, the lamb and the sheep prices, the animal prices kind of edge up. <laughs> but for the last 20 years, the wool prices have not is we are not dominant in this industry at all. Not only not, but the U.S. as well. We are we are price takers. The world market, particularly for wool, we we have to live with. We we can't do a whole lot to increase our our wool prices here because it's a highly traded commodity that's dominated by the Australians, and the Australians have a lot of sheep, and they've they've also been dealing with, particularly in the Pacific Basin. A decline in demand for for wool, and so that has kept those wool prices pretty pretty flat on a year to year basis. If we look at the weekly prices for for Australian wool, and they do a very good job of reporting weekly prices for their for the East Coast wool shipments, those have been just up and down over the last two years since COVID. I mean, one one week it's up, another week it's down, and even compared to where they were two years ago, they are still down a, a considerable amount. So globally. What the Australians do with wool prices dictates what our wool prices are, but we've been able to maintain those prices because of our, our higher quality of wool than generally what the Australians and the, and the New Zealanders and other countries export. Um, but because the wool prices are not moving up, neither will ours. So this is kind of that, that returns for sheep and wool that we've looked at for the other, for the other commodities. And the operating costs are up in 2021. Again, some of that's purchase fee, but the sheep in Nevada, again, like cattle, are have a uh, are have a lot of public land grazing for them. <clears throat> They're grazing, so that kind of helps hold that down. But for for purchases of things like uh, you know uh, winter feeding. For hay and any other feedstuffs, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, additives and things of that nature. Those have gone up uh, some this year and, and, and are expected to remain relatively high over the next few years. Also, labor costs. Here's the thing about, about sheep that we, when we, we start looking at the cow-calf industry compared to the sheep industry, 
The labor costs are generally higher for the sheep industry because what is the one important thing for sheep? It's the wool and the shearing. And so labor costs are going up. And so shearing costs are, are going up as well. And that's going to add to the operating, the overall operating cost in the sheep industry. But because of the ability to, to rationalize, keep those prices high, rationalize the, the inventories of sheep, continue to decline them, on a dollars per bred U, dollars per U, they're maintaining, they're able to maintain profitability much like they have in recent years. Again, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty around these things. And if, if the um, wool markets completely crash, you know, that will hurt us. One other thing that does help us is there has been some stabilization in sheep meat prices in the last few years. And one of those has been because of, uh, in some areas, because of uh, a, a relatively minor, but it's still noticeable ethnic shift, particularly with folks from the Middle East that come in that eat more sheep and, and, and goats, but they, they, they eat more of that, or particularly around their religious holidays. Uh, so that's kind of helps uh, keep the demand for sheep meat up a little bit, uh, or at least not falling as, as much as it used to. So that's that's a bright spot too, is, is that ethnic shift has provided some, uh, some stable, at least stabilized demand for sheep meat. And that's about the end of it. Uh, it Malika, do you have any comments or do we wanna just open it up for questions? I think we can open it up for questions. I uh, did want to mention, you know, you talk a lot about the uncertainty and we talk about this upward price pressure. And uh, I just, you know, again, want to sort of highlight that being a dismal scientist and all mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that uh, this is brought widespread and persistent. And it's sort of, it, it is the result of um, Mike, if you want to uh, stop your screen share, I think there too. Um, it's sort of a perfect storm. So we have um, the impacts of COVID. We have persistent drought, um, and these these uh, really just layer on top of each other um, and other climate impacts. So we talk about the persistent drought in the West. We have floods and in other parts of the world and the other parts of the country. I mentioned, um, you know, China's high vegetable prices. I think earlier this morning we were talking about that on a meeting that in some cases it's higher than their protein prices in, in China and that's because of floods, not drought. So um, we're really seeing a lot of changes. We, uh, I have some numbers here from September just in terms of uh, consumer prices. Uh, Beef and veal were up 17, 18%. Pork was up about 13%. Poultry was up 6%. These are all um, September prices reported as compared to 2020. So comparing 2021 to 2020, eggs up about 13%. Um, and the USDA forecast for these consumer prices are expected to increase another additional percent from where they are now by the end of 2021. Um, we talked about fertilizer, you know, the increase, you know, sometimes doubling and tripping, tripling of fertilizer prices as it relates to fuel inputs, all of those um, will flow through and we may see a delay in our um, producer costs in Nevada, but they will trickle down um, in terms yeah. of prices that uh, people are willing to pay in terms of margins, um, that sort of thing. And then the other, um, agricultural commodity that we're really seeing an upward pressure on is wheat. And so um, wheat can be used for feed, but more commonly is used for food um, in the US and, and uh, developed world. But um, the drought has heavily impacted wheat prices and we're seeing increases in prices right now um, of a you know 20 30 percent for wheat prices and so um we have scarcity we have upward price pressure and um we are not sure when um, we'll see relief um because the uh, things that are affecting it 
global pandemic or endemic as it may become and the climate impacts are really there's so much uncertainty surrounding each one of those yeah you know that's an interesting point about the weed malika is is there's a little bit more to it than just um than, than just you know being used as, as a feed as a, which 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 it is the other thing is is that other crops compete with wheat for area in some parts of the U.S., it's sorghum. In some parts of the world, it's it's oil seeds, uh, soybeans, and those prices are are very high. Mm -hmm. So it's pulling area out of out of wheat, which will raise that prices those prices too. That's a good point. The other thing that I forgot to mention that I had intended to mention during this talk was talk a little bit about the supply chain, which we did a little bit, but I don't want to talk about it in in the terms that we normally think that we normally think about. I want to talk about it from some of the labor market impacts. Uh, and, and I've been looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, data that have, that have come out. And if we look at, compared to a year and a half ago, February, February of 2020, if we look at February of 2020, we know that we've got a higher unemployment rate. Unemployment has gone up and it's come back down. It's now, I think, 4.8% was the last number. Kind of hard to compare that to, to a year and a half ago, though. There's one big thing that has happened, and that is, is that there has been a pronounced decrease in labor force participation. Uh, labor force participation was a little over 63%, which was kind of typical a year and a half ago in February of, of 2020. It's now down to about 61%, which translates into about 3 million folks in terms of the labor force. Not to mention that, that, that in February of 2020, the unemployment rate was 3.4%. It's now 4.8. Now, the labor force includes people that are working between the ages of, of 16 and 64. That's how it's measured. People in the workforce that are actually working and people actively work, looking for work. So that means anybody that's drawing unemployment is counted in the labor force because in order to draw unemployment, you have to be actively work, looking for work. So between about 3 million fewer folks uh, in the labor force and a uh, percent and a half increase in the unemployment rate. What we're really looking at would be if you just do some quick back of the envelope um, uh, calculations that the, the really un the unemployment rate that we ought to be considering is one that'll be closer to 7% still. Hmm. So that, that, that tells you that we don't have everybody back to work, that, that there are a lot of jobs that are unfilled out there. That's the point that I, I, I really wanna take this to for the supply chain is we have a lot of people that are, are not producing, that are not in those production jobs. And we also have a problem with uh, uh, getting goods to market. There is an extreme shortage of truck drivers in terms of getting things from our domestic producers and getting things from ports uh, in, into our domestic markets. So that's one of the reasons uh, why we're we having supply chain issues. It's not just, just COVID keeping the, 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 the plants from operating. And it's not just you know, higher transportation costs, but it's, we've got a smaller workforce out there that, that are participating in the whole economy, which is what it takes in order to uh, keep consumption up. It's, uh, you know, Tom and Lee made some comments about that, but that's just kind of what I, I, I see at those numbers. Well, Mike, well, Mike, we're kind of at the end of the hour. I don't know if, if Scott, Terry, or Zoe uh, Hugenton have any questions. If y'all, any one of you have questions. If not, uh, we're in the end. Of, uh, one thing I was going to say on percentages, I always like to do is when we talk about when I was doing my commodities, if you have, you're selling your hogs at $100, 100 weight, they drop to $50 a hundred weight, that's a 50% decrease. But if they go from $50 a hundred weight to $100 a hundred weight, that's a 100% increase. So that's that's where those looking at percentages can be very awful what sizes. And I think the other thing that people aren't talking about, and there was a very good PBS movie on it about Frontline this week, uh, the quantitative easing is gonna start to ease off. <laughs> And uh, that means the monetary, uh, imp there's maybe some impacts on the monetary that we haven't even looked at. And uh, 
the word uh, the quantitative easing um, if you listen to people who are in the monetary this is an experiment they haven't tried yet and they don't know what's going to happen when they start to put the take the foot off the pedal on buying bad bonds and all that so uh, there is a lot of uncertainty out there very much <clears throat> I just want to add one more um, thought about upward pressure on food prices and as it relates to the supply chain. Um, one of the other uh, points of interest I was reading about is that it really seems like the more processed a food is, the higher likelihood there will be that it won't be on the shelf. So um, the items that this, the article that I read talked about in particular was Prego spaghetti sauce, Lunchables, snacks, Pringles, chips, and um, oh, I can't think. But and anyway, because it's not just the food inputs where there's a problem in the supply chain, it's also the packaging. And so um, when we first, you know, went into the um, pandemic and we were doing uh, these webinars or podcasts on supply chain, we're talking about how there's a separate meat supply chain for commercial meat versus retail meat. We, if you think of the supply chain as a agglomeration of thousands of supply mm -hmm. chains for different um, input goods. So when you have processed food, so meat is processed, obviously, you don't just go buy a cow, you buy the cut down pieces of meat. Well, that has to be wrapped in some sort of plastic or styrofoam or um, paper, some sort of packaging. And the same is true for Prego spaghetti sauce and Pringles and Lunchables and all of that. So there's a whole separate supply chain that's having its own set of issues that we haven't even addressed here that impacts delivery um, and the ability to keep those goods on the shelf. So it becomes very, very complex. Um, yeah, there's uh, you got to go get your own turkey and chop it. Uh, the uh, uh, but anyway, we're at the end. Uh, this has been recorded, and we'll be once we get it out on the web, uh, we'll advertise and people can pick it up. And uh, maybe we'll look in the next quarter. We even I think these data that get updated is going to be more and more interesting every year. Every one is going to be a interesting quarter. Uh, thanks. Malika and Mike and uh, all the people who are attending and uh, if you have any questions, send them to me. Uh, so this will end it. So Bob, can you end the podcast? I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much.